Good morning. Welcome to the home of Unitarian Universalism in Central Washington. My name is Rita Salama, and I serve on the worship team, the fundraising committee, and I am a newly elected board member. I'm also the celebrant for today's service. If you are a visitor this morning, we are so glad you are here. This morning, we welcome every person of goodwill, just as you are. However you get around, whomever you love, whatever body you inhabit, whatever your age, you are welcome here. We invite everyone to join us for a social hour after the service, both in person and on Zoom. For the folks on Zoom, you can find our order of service in the chat. Now, please take a moment, look around you and greet your neighbors. Well, you can tell it's good to be together this morning. <laughs> Conversations can continue during the coffee hour. Thank you, Kathy. The theme of today's service is about beliefs. And every Sunday we gather here on the homeland of the Pascosa. They were indigenous people, they are indigenous people with their own beliefs ways of life, customs, and myths. Because of a lack of respect for indigenous ways, the Pascosa were dehumanized. The United States government made agreements with the Pascosa in 1855 and 1893 about their rights to their land, but broke these agreements through a number of nefarious ways. They stole the land that had been ceded to them. I say they, but it's really we, the United States. We still profit from those actions and the Pascosa still live here, although they are not able to host community gatherings, practice traditions, or conduct tribal meetings on their original homelands because the land no longer belongs to them. They continue to keep their beliefs alive, though, and seek to have all their rights recognized. For more information about the indigenous people in this area, please see the Colville Tribes website, and the link is in your order of service. Our opening words are, here we are so gathered. This is a responsive reading, and the slides will be on the up on the slides, you'll see the reading. So um, the congregation, instead of me saying something and you responding, we're going to do this by sides. So the left side of the congregation will read the text that is in red, the right, the blue text, and all of us will read the purple text together. So let us begin with the left side. Your left. <laughs> but thank you for clearing that up. Okay. Here is where we are gathered in the presence of the sacred. Here is where we gather to experience the holy. Here is where together we face the unanswerable questions and acknowledge that not knowing is as sublime as it is frustrating. Here we gather to worship, to experience something happen. Perhaps something different for each of us according to our beliefs. Something unnamed, uncategorized, and unusual, yet absolutely necessary. Here we are so gathered, 
our minds, our hearts, and our souls. This is the time in our service when we kindle a sacred flame. If you are joining remotely, please feel free to light your own chalice as well. Our chalice is a reminder that we are not alone as we join Unitarians and Unitarian Universalists all over the world in lighting our chalices this morning. Our chalice lighting words are by Gregory David Miller. This fire is a reminder of the light within us all The yearning for freedom, the longing for truth, the flame of intuition, the torch of conscience. We dedicate this service to the remembrance of this holy light. And now Sarah Severson will share our wisdom reading. The Laughing Heart by Charles Bukowski. Your life is your life. Don't let it be clubbed into dank submission. Be on the watch. There are ways out. There is a light somewhere. It may not be much light, but it beats the darkness. Be on the watch. The gods will offer you chances. Know them, take them. You can't beat death, but you can beat death in life sometimes. And the more often you learn to do it, the more light there will be. Your life is your life. Know it while you have it. You are marvelous. The gods wait to delight you. Well, I'd like to start this part of our service with a reading from A Holy Curiosity, Stories of Religious Faith by the Reverend Bruce T. Marshall. So quote, Unitarian Universalist congregations are bound together by a commitment we make to each other. Our promise is that we will together without credo requirement or submission to external third authority, create a religious community. That simple promise contains many implications. There's an interpretation of the nature and sources of religious authority. Religious authority for us is not vested in sacraments of doctrine, religious hierarchy, or sacred texts. Religious authority, rather, comes from within each individual who chooses to live as best he or she can by the truth he or she finds. Religious authority is centered in conscience and therefore is shared among the congregation. In the promise we make to create a congregation is an affirmation that we all have access to religious truth." Unquote. Two of our UU principles support the right to seek and choose for ourselves. One is a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and the other is acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth within our congregations. Our religion allows its members to let their light shine and in their own particular way. You may have heard the joke about how many UUs does it take to screw in a light bulb? The answer, we choose not to make a statement either in favor of or against the use of light bulbs. However, if on your own journey, you have found that light bulbs work for you, that is fine. You are invited to write a poem or compose a modern dance about your light bulb. During our annual light bulb service, we will explore a number of light bulb traditions, including LED, incandescent, fluorescent, three-way, long life, and tinted, all of which are equally valid paths to luminescence. So today we're going to be hearing from three people sharing their path to luminescence. Our first speaker is Pat Whitfield. Pat moved to Wenatchee nine years ago following her daughter, and they must have liked it because other family members moved here and now there are four, gener gener four generations here in Wenatchee. Pat began attending CUF not too long after her move. She is semi-retired, 
She has taught all levels of education from elementary school to the doctoral level, was a dean and also an educational consultant on the Navajo Reservation and for Challenge Schools. With her joy of teaching, she couldn't totally retire. She is currently an adjunct faculty member at Wenatchee Valley College, teaching public speaking and interpersonal communication. Pat loves what she calls junking, visiting thrift stores and yard sales to find treasures. And she was once a contestant on the nationally televised quiz show, Password, winning enough for the down payment on her first home. And now, and now Pat. <laughs> Well, thank you. It's an honor to be asked to share my path, my history. I'm going to start with my childhood. My parents, my mother was Catholic, my father was Protestant. When I was very little, my mother used to take me to mass on Sunday with her. Well, when you're that little, you don't know what the heck is going on, but you know, there I went. But after my sister was born, my mother didn't get out of bed on Sundays and my father who I said was not Catholic, took me to St. Joseph's Church in West Orange, New Jersey, where I went to catechism class and mass all by myself. That was very generous, but my father was a kind and loving man. I went to parochial school, and when I first really thought seriously about God, it was in the spring around Easter when we were collecting money for the missions so that there would be enough money to feed and clothe and send missionaries to take care of the pagan babies. And that's when I first heard about limbo. How many of you have ever, ever heard about limbo out there in the, I see one or two hands. Yeah, heaven, hell, and purgatory. We know what those are, but limbo. Well, for those of you who don't know, limbo is like this parking lot somewhere out there in the ozone where all those who have never been baptized go for all eternity and they can never enter heaven. And as a young child, I'm thinking, if God is nice, why would God treat these innocent little babies this way and never let them get to heaven? And that question was never answered, and it wasn't one I dared ask, because if any of you have ever gone to parochial school, you know you don't want to mess with the nuns. <laughs> Fast forward about 20 years, I was living in Manhattan Beach, California, and it was a beautiful Sunday morning, and I woke up, and I thought, I... I, I think I'd rather go to the beach today. I don't think God said that it would be a mortal sin not to go to mass on Sunday and that I would go to hell. So I'm going to the beach instead of going to hell. I went to the beach. It was a beautiful sunny day and I enjoyed it. And I waited all day long for that lightning bolt to come out of heaven and strike me dead. And it never did. And that was the last that I ever went to mass as a regular Sunday experience. My sister's mother-in-law said to me one day when we were talking about faith, whatever that is, and she said, you know, you might want to try Reverend Brown's church in Redondo Beach. It was a church of religious science. Now that is not Christian science. Um, the church of religious science is a new thought movement that came out of uh, the the very beginning of the 20th century, but the founder was born in the 19th century, and I'm sure you're aware that the set, the 18th and 19th centuries had a lot of people involved in what was called New Thought, and that was based on religious and metaphysical presuppositions that existed in the United States um, starting in the 19th century, much like the Universal Church of Amer Universalist Church of America, which was founded in 1793, and the American Unitarian Association in 1825. So um, I was involved in the Church of Religious Science for over 40 years, in fact, until I came here. But having been an academic migrant worker, as I moved from various parts of the country, often there was no, you know, fellowship or church to go to on Sunday, but I stayed connected through reading and those kind of things. And whenever I traveled, had the chance to go and interact in a personal way. However, when I was moving to Wenatchee, 
I found out there was no Church of Religious Science here. And I went, well, I like to have the experience on Sundays of starting my week in an uplifting kind of way. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And then I learned about Cuff. And I thought, well, I knew a little bit about the New Thought Movement, and I research things, having been an educator for all those years. And I thought, well, um, I'll, I'll give it a try. I hope it works. Well, excuse me. I found a home. I found a spiritual and metaphysical home. And it was so nice to be in that environment uh, that validated what I believed and what I needed to learn. There were so many aspects of it besides the idea of fellowship. Um, so if I talk about what I believe, first of all, I have to think about the service this morning. I thought that this reading about here we are gathered works perfectly for me in terms of what I believe. And you all have it in your, in your program so you can do that. The other thing that I believe was contained in our seven principles. And I'm not going to take the time today to read them to you, but you know what they are. They're all very validating in terms of respecting others, in terms of being open to uh, different ways of thinking. And I think that's what makes the world a better place. We could certainly use a lot of that right now. But I think that what that there are two principles that mean a great deal to me. First of all, I do believe in a divine intelligence. I don't think that God is this gray haired dude with a beard sitting up wherever God is supposed to be. But I do believe that the universe and the world in which we live has to have resulted from more than the Big Bang. And we as human beings are part of that grand design. And we have our intelligence and our caring and our hearts and our curiosity and our fellowship as something with which we were endowed. And every one of us has that to whatever extent we use it. Um, I also believe in the power of affirmation. Those of you who are vintage might remember <laughs> that uh, uh, an eminent Presbyterian uh, researcher and, and a clergyman, um, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, wrote a book many, many years ago called The Power of Positive Thinking. Now that sounds pretty generic, but as I did never read that book until I was mature or close to vintage myself, but I believe in the power of affirmation. I think that by extending positive thoughts to not only yourself, but to others makes a difference in your life and in their life, rather than sinking into solitude and despair. And I've seen it work so many times, not only in my own life, but in others to whom I have extended the power of affirmation. So I, I believe in divine intelligence and I believe in the power of affirmation. However, I do also believe that you have to be true to yourself. And perhaps you're familiar, this is a saying that I live by every single solitary day from Shakespeare. This above all to thine own self be true, and it follows as the day the night, thou canst not be false to any man. Of course, he wasn't in the era of being sure that you use generic gender terms. He meant everybody, not men only. And I'd like to close with what is the best quotation I can think of, and it's by Ernest Holmes, who did in fact uh, find, found the science of mind. But I think that this synopsizes what I truly believe. We should give of ourselves in love and service, in a spirit of generosity and good fellowship. To refuse to give is to refuse to receive. I like that because it deals with the reciprocity that we we ought to be practicing, for everything moves in circles. Real giving is the givingness of the self, a kind word, a thoughtful act, perhaps just a smile can lighten the burden of self and others.
This I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Our next speaker is Gary Pape, and I swear I didn't twist my husband's arm to get him to speak for this. <laughs> he asked what the subject of the service was, and I told him, and he said, I, I'd like to do that. So um, I said, yes. <laughs> no, I'll finally no. <laughs> uh, uh. Gary moved from Chicago in 1996 to start a private dental practice in Wenatchee. Then after 16 years, decided to pursue another career as a dental educator, and we both moved to Southern California. 10 years later, in 2022, we moved back to Wenatchee after Gary retired. But like Pat, he couldn't quite give up the educational field. And he now works part-time for a dental school in Elk Grove, California as well as doing some consulting work. He started attending CUUF when he first moved here and then immediately when we returned. So that's 16 years plus one. He likes hiking, reading, exercising, and playing with his grandkids. And in 2021, he won first place in the Chicago 5K in his age group. So, and now Gary. Thank you, Rita. Um, so, uh, good morning, everybody. You know, as Rita said, I uh, readily accepted the offer to speak at this service. Well, that's not exactly right. I thought about it for a few minutes, and then after Rita let go of my arm, <laughs> um, I accepted. So, you might wonder why I accepted. And actually, I was thinking about that. It's just the date got closer and closer. Why did I accept this again? But my answer is this, I've always enjoyed the This I Believe services here. So during the first 16 years here, we I think we used to have This I Believe two or three times a year, and I always found them very valuable. And I also, about 15 years ago, I, I did a This I Believe, and I thought, you know, I think it's time to do this again. So I recognized that in preparing for this talk that I would benefit from exploring my beliefs and letting Rita know what those are. And um, and I hope that this talk uh, sparked some discovery in you. And I also would hope that uh, at some point you consider doing this, I believe, because I think it's valuable for yourself. And I think it's, it's a good way to engage in the fellowship and for you guys to know us too. So my process began with determining exactly what beliefs to address. So I decided to tackle the following. Is there a creator? Is one life's path informed by the creator or a creative force? And if one follows this path, are there lives and life, are there a reward than this life and afterlife? And what happens if one doesn't follow the path? What are the consequences? And how exactly do you find out what the path is? Or what your path should be? And does the creator or creative force, does it exert control here on earth? And finally, what happens after we die? So I, I basically decided to go after the low hanging fruit. <laughs> so just like Pat, I need to share some uh, personal context. Uh, my family of origin was not religious. Uh, my mother was a non-practicing Catholic and my father was a non-practicing Protestant. And after my parents divorced when I was 11, uh, Sunday was dad's day. And so he would start today by taking my brothers and I to church, to a Protestant church. We attended for a few years, but that was really the extent of any kind of formal religious education, which is, is, was basically minimal. So then the question is, well, how do I explore these big questions? What are my sources? And so it's really not the Bible or the Quran or any other formal religious text. Well, or more accurately, they're not the dominant resources for me because you can't live in this society without hearing different passages from the Bible. And I think my source is my inner voice. And I think it's been talked about already here, whether that's your inner light and the story that Rita was reading, but it's, it's my inner voice. And I recognize that there's certainly many external contributions to that voice, like teachings from the Bible. Other sources are reflections of my own life experiences, reading books on philosophy, psychology, spirituality, deep conversations with friends, you know, and sermons from this pulpit, 
cultural, cultural messages too numerous to count, some that align with me, many that don't. And what about the collective unconscious, or again, the Holy Spirit or the force? Is that somehow inside me? And I don't disbelieve that any or all of these could be contributing to my inner voice. I'm really not sure how it, my inner voice developed. But I believe my inner voice sounds like me. It resonates with me. And when I listen to it, and more importantly, when I act on it, I feel most alive. I feel closer to honoring the gift of life. And I feel closer to honoring the unique gifts that I have as a person. So what does my inner voice say? Well, it says to be kind. It says to seek to understand myself and to others, seek and understand others. It tells me that we are all works in progress. It tells me that when we can help others, we should, and that we should pay attention to important things and to be discerning with all that noise that we hear from social media, from electronic resources, from the airwaves. It tells me not to give in to fear or dwell excessively in pain. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that I've mastered any of these. Again, remember, I'm a work in progress. And finally, and this is another tough one, how do you embrace the mystery while staying curious and in the state of wonder? So let's get back to that low hanging fruit. Is there a creator? I have no clue. It certainly seems like a master designer was involved, but then who designed the designer? So for me, I don't really know, I, I don't really know, need to know the answer to that question in order to follow my voice. And relate, relatedly, is there a creator approved path? Again, I'm not sure. But as mentioned, bef mentioned before, being kind, understanding, helping others is good enough for me in terms of a path. Are there consequences and rewards? Sure, there are in this life. After this life, no clue. And, I, and it's not really that important to me. How do you find the path? Well, I don't believe there's a single path, right? but rather your path. And you find it by paying attention to your inner voice, being curious about yourself and others and the world. Does your creator exert control? You know, I don't believe so. I believe we are in control of our responses to all the actions and the mystery in our life. And what happens to us after we die? Again, no clue. I don't mean to be flip, but I'm okay with not knowing. At least I think I am okay with that. Well, thanks for listening. Thanks, Rita, for inviting me to talk and best wishes on exploring your inner voice. Thank you, Gary. Our next speaker is Melissa Orlandini. Melissa moved to Wenatchee in November 2021 from Hershey, Pennsylvania and started attending CUF in May of 2022, so not that long ago. Um, and she started when our in-person services started again. So it's good to be together. She is a public service civil engineer designing operational safety improvements to the transportation networks. She enjoys reading, karaoke, rolling on the floor with her dogs, and connecting deeply with other humans. Melissa says that she has no impulse control when it comes to houseplants and puppies. And if you're at a social event with her, she said you're likely to find her on the floor rolling around with the dogs. <laughs> and now Melissa. I just wanted to start out by thank you, thanking you for having me here. Uh, like Rita said, I haven't been here for very long, but it has been an impactful time that I have been here. Um, and I'm really grateful to have gotten to know all of you uh, as I have and gotten to know the space that you guys create in this building um, and outside of it. And it's been a really beautiful part of my life in the last two years. Uh, I grew up in an Italian Catholic household in central Pennsylvania. Uh, we weren't particularly uh, stringent Catholics, more like um, Christmas Easter Catholics, um, but we definitely still had some of that strong presence. Um, I grew up, did all the sacraments, did the things, and I remember very vividly learning that um, 
if there was a God like the Catholics say that there is a God, then he would not have made me the way that I am. And it really um, started kind of this fracturing within myself um, where I kind of learned to despise who I was. Um, and this was way before I came out as queer, um, but it, it was still enough to know that um, I, I had learned that it wasn't, it didn't resonate with, with what I believed and what I had experienced in my life. Um, and so I kind of had this option to either throw myself into the religious beliefs that I had learned or take a step back. So as a very young teenager, um, I kind of took a step back from the, the Catholic church and firmly identified as an atheist for a really long time. Um, this was reinforced my immersion in, in logic and, and science-based thinking um, and a complete dissociation from my body. Um, and so I, I spent years really disliking who I was. I can't blame that all on Catholicism, but it, it certainly played a part. I'd like to blame another part on the patriarchy. Um, <laughs> And I've spent years uh, recovering from, from the impacts and the way that I hurt myself um, because of the lessons that I had learned. Um, I now cherish who I am, but I work actively every day um, on that journey. And I've learned that my self-talk is sacred. Um, my body listens when I, what I say to, uh, about it. And so now I only speak love to it, even on days that it's really hard. Um, I really always enjoyed deep conversations, engaging in the big questions um, in college, although I still had identified as an atheist. I always took as many philosophy classes as I possibly could because it was a way to wrestle with the big questions without being triggered by the God word. Um, I had a roommate in college. I moved in and as I was moving my stuff in, she was moving in a giant cross with, that was uh, made up of Bible quotes. And I was like, here we go. She's gonna think I'm Satan. Um, <laughs> but instead, what I got out of it was a really deep, beautiful friendship where we learned to love and respect each other's beliefs. Uh, when I was complaining, she was never like, oh, well, God would think this. And uh, when she was complaining, I would always be like, well, what does your belief system tell you about how to handle this? And it really taught me a lot um, in just interpersonal connections on how to respect the way that different people walk through the world. Um, and I feel like I got an incredible lesson um, in, that, in that opportunity. Um, once I left college, I found more spaces to wrestle with these big questions um, without being in an actual church on a long work drive, I discovered a podcast called Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. Um, and before I talk about that, I'd like to firmly denounce JK Rowling's belief systems and hate speech that she's come out with recently. Um, it's something that I've had to personally wrestle with because I, um, it, it, Harry Potter is a part of who I am, just lifelong. I've read the books my entire life. I have learned lessons. I've identified with different characters um, and so to, to separate the art from the artist is really difficult. I'm very supportive of the trans communities and for everybody to be able to speak who they are from the whole, uh, from their heart. This I believe. Um, and so I'm still struggling on that, but I also don't want to cut off a part of my identity um, as I'm trying to wrestle with that. Um, so this podcast is hosted by Harvard Divinity School uh, graduates. One of the co-hosts, her name is uh, Vanessa Zoltan. She is a Jewish atheist who is the descendant of Holocaust survival, survivors. Um, and the other um, host is Casper Turkayle, who is a gay Christian man with a British accent. And ooh -wee, is it fun to listen to them. Um, they have a lot of humor and compassion and the way that they have wrestled with stuff during that con that podcast just taught me so much and prepared me um, with different tools to, to navigate life. Um, and the idea of taking a book that I loved that was not traditionally a sacred text and just treating it seriously and seeing what lessons you could learn from it um, really resonated with me. I thought it was fascinating and quirky and it was just right up my alley. Um, so 
later, uh, as I was starting to experience panic attacks, I um, helped found a local chapter of this podcast, a book club, um, where I found a group of individuals where I felt seen for the first real time, um, navigating my own mental health journey. Um, every Sunday, we would meet at a local coffee shop, do our check-ins similar to our joys and sorrows here, um, practice rituals like chalice lighting to engage us in the space, um, and dis uh, discuss the chapter that we had just read um, through a specific theme. And I think that that was the first space where I really felt a true sense of a church community. Um, Alongside these people, I, I discovered the benefits of, and challenges of um, therapy and medication and um, each person having their own unique mental health journey. Um, so it, I believe that those of us who are labeled as too sensitive, too soft and abnormal are, are the very best of us. Um, we feel deeply, we sense things that others can't and we're able to help provide support to a society in ways that others can't access. I'm not sure I can even deeply connect with people who are not at least a little bit crazy. Um, our time meeting in person for book club was, was cut short by the COVID pandemic, and this led to a diagnosis for myself it, with chronic depression. I'm sure it's something that I've always lived with, but again, I was so disconnected from my own body that I had no way of, of accessing it. And so um, I had just been strongly coping using avoidance ten tendencies, keeping myself really busy um, and not really paying attention to what my body was telling me. Um, I learned how dire that disconnection was uh, when I got diagnosed with depression and the following day was incapacitated by vertigo for three days. And I think it was a very firm uh, message for my body to slow the heck down and just sit down and be still for a while. And that is a huge lesson that I learned during the pandemic. It was really the first time that I let myself be still and just be alone and, and wrestle with my demons a bit. Um, so enter a spiritual awakening of sorts. Um, I started having experiences that I didn't have the language to engage with. Um, so that really started me to want to seek uh, spaces, churches, religious groups to try and understand what I was experiencing and hear what other people had their own personal experience. Um, and what I've, I've learned to believe is that uh, what I think people call God, I've taken to calling it Gus, God, universe, spirit, whatever you want. Um, it lives in us, and that's really the only way to, that I, I know how to access it. Um, and I, what people I think also call intuition is a way of the metaphysical to pull us to where we're supposed to go. Um, my experience is almost never a firm calling in the English language, um, but it's a feeling or an omen or something in the external environment that pulls me where I think my path is leading. Um, I believe that as long as humans have existed, we have always wrestled with the spiritual and searched for community around engaging with this, um, which is really why I found my home here in Cuff. Um, I did some church shopping when I first moved to the area and I had to treat it like an academic exercise. I took my notebook with me and I was like, all right, this pissed me off. I don't believe this, but like this resonated. Um, and so I was able to kind of sort through where I was uh, leading and like Rita said, my first time here was the Mother's Day uh, service, and I just got a lot of um, relief from being in a space that acknowledged the differences of experience that we all have. Um, I do believe I have faith that things work out the way that they're supposed to, and I believe that they're meant to teach us lessons along the way. And since I've learned that belief and felt it deeply in my heart, my mental health has done so much better. Um, I'm no longer having panic attacks. I'm managing my depression in a completely different way. And I feel like being in spaces of community just feed my soul and, and keep me going. Um, I believe that all bodies are good bodies and that they are the way that they are meant to be and that people will only grow and flourish if they are loved seen and accepted for exactly who they are as they are right now.
this, I believe. Thank you, Melissa. Well, as Gary said, if um, any of you are willing to share your own path to luminescence, um, you can let me know or, or contact Lynn Madsen, who's the chair of the worship team. Our closing words are by Andrew Pakula. Let there be light, the light of joy, the light of happiness, and the light of contentment. May it illuminate our paths and fill our lives with peace. And now please join me in saying the child's extinguishing words that are in the order of silence. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now we'll form our closing circle around the room, joining hands and singing our closing song. <laughs>